checking, uh, keeping an eye on the chat. Um, but uh, in the event that um, you put something in the chat and I don't recognize it, uh, um, uh, please speak up or raise your hand or something like that to catch my attention. Okay, so um, this workshop, uh, just to remind you, is to uh, introduce hybrid study designs, offer you some guidance about when to use them and which type to use given the state of the science, uh, and also to give you some hands-on experience designing a hybrid study design. And I anticipate um, if there's time remaining, we can do some individual consultation and feedback. So I sort of organized this workshop into those three parts. The first part, which I suspect will take about 60 minutes, maybe 90 minutes, uh, depending on how engaged people are and how many questions they have, really be more me sharing information with you about hybrid design designs um, and really going through that sort of guidance about when to use them and, and how to select which uh, type of hybrid design is best uh, for, for your particular intervention or research study. Um, there'll be lots of time for a question and answer built into that. We have three hours, so we have plenty of time together. Um, and then after this sort of didactic uh, session uh, portion with the Q&A, we'll take a break uh, so people can uh, get up, uh, get some additional coffee, maybe use the bathroom or check their email really quickly. Um, and for those of you who've decided that's interesting, but I'm not, <laughs> you know, I'm not so sure I want to do a hybrid design, um, you're welcome to step off at that point, uh, And hopefully you'll feel like you learned something interesting. Uh, and for those of you who are interested uh, in coming back after that short break, um, we'll move into sort of a guided exercise, again, where we work through some worksheets uh, to help you kind of flesh out a hybrid design uh, of interest for you. And then if there is time remaining after we do that workshopping part of it, I'll hang on here and we can do some one-on-one -on -one consultation uh, if, uh, if for those of you who want more individualized um, uh, uh, feedback on your design and folks can hang on and we can do it in a fishbowl format or uh, or you can hang out in the waiting room or just half listen and then uh, we, can, we can wrap up the time that way. So this is uh, a very big group and I am glad that I decided that I would start at the beginning here and make the assumption that uh, folks might not know a whole lot about implementation science um, um, or might have heard about it, but don't know much about it. So I'd like to take a few minutes or begin at the beginning and really orient everybody to implementation science um, on the assumption, like I said, that some people may be more familiar with it than others. And since I don't recognize a lot of the names uh, in the participant list, it sounds like I made a, a pretty good choice to, to really begin at the beginning here. Okay, so uh, buckle up, here we go. So what is implementation science? Implementation science, as the U.S. National Institutes of Health defines it, is the scientific study of methods to promote the integration of research findings and evidence-based interventions into healthcare practice and policy. Now, that definition works for me, but it often generates blank stares when I use it uh, to describe implementation science to people outside my field. So let me break it down into simpler terms and compare implementation research with effectiveness research on the assumption that you are probably more familiar with effectiveness research than implementation research. So implementation research starts with evidence-based interventions. These interventions could be programs, practices, principles, procedures, products, pills, or policies. We call these the seven Ps. What's important is that these interventions should have some evidence supporting them. So let's call the evidence-based intervention the thing that you want to see implemented. When we do effectiveness research, we evaluate whether the thing works. And the primary research question is, how uh, does the thing improve health outcomes? When we do implementation research, we study how best to help people and places do the thing. If effectiveness research answers the what question, what things should we do to improve health outcomes, then implementation research answers the how question. How do we get the thing done? How do we get it integrated into routine practice? Implementation strategies are the stuff that we can do to help people and places do the thing. We can do all kinds of stuff to help people and places do the thing. We can use training to help them do the thing. We could use audit and feedback to help them do the thing. We could enlist the help of opinion leaders to do the thing and so on. 
The main outcomes in effectiveness research are health outcomes. Does the thing improve health? The main outcomes in implementation research focus on how much or how well people and places do the thing. Good examples of implementation outcomes uh, include the percentage of clinicians delivering the thing, or the percentage of eligible patients receiving the thing, or the extent to which clinicians are following the guidelines for doing the thing, or even the skill with which clinicians are delivering the thing. In a sense, implementation research picks up where effectiveness research leaves off. Once we have sufficient evidence to support doing the thing, we turn our attention to how to get the thing integrated into routine practice. I want to pause here and emphasize this distinction between evidence-based interventions and implementation strategies. This distinction is crucial for grasping how implementation research differs from effectiveness research, and it's also crucial for grasping the concept of hybrid effectiveness implementation research designs, as well as the three types of hybrid designs that I'm going to describe in a few minutes. So again, Evidence-based interventions are programs, practices, principles, procedures, products, pills, or policies that have been shown to improve health behaviors, health outcomes, or health-related environments. And don't be thrown by the term health-related environments. Recognize that some interventions help to create healthier environments, like no smoking policies, or increasing sidewalks and green spaces to make neighborhoods more walkable, or increasing the uh, availability of uh, fruits and vegetables uh, in uh, cafeteria environments and so forth. So interventions are the things that we want to see implemented because they improve health outcomes or health behaviors. So. I'm just curious, what are some of the things that you would like to see implemented or implemented more consistently or with greater quality in either healthcare or community kinds of settings? If you could just put them in the chat, this would be great. Give me a sense for what is the sort of range of interventions or things that of, are of interest to the folks um, participating in the workshop today. Let's see if I can add. Effective tutoring for students with reading abilities. Yes. So although I've been focusing on health outcomes and health-related uh, interventions, they could be educational kinds of interventions and so forth. Oh, my goodness. They're going so fast I can hardly give up. Let me see here. Adherence to follow-up visits. Yes. Evidence-based psychotherapies. Great. Long-acting prep. Screening. Yes. These all look like good interpretation for patients who speak languages other than English. Yes, that would be great. Effective culturally adaptive mental health interventions, prep uptake, CBT for chronic pain. These are all great examples, all terrific examples of, uh, of interventions, many of which are evidence-based, which can help improve patients or clients or community members' health behaviors or their health outcomes. Yeah, um, so Gina, this one here, PCP to specialist electronic consultation for platforms, that is a, maybe I would say more of an implementation strategy than a, an intervention itself because it doesn't directly influence patient behavior or patient health outcomes. So you might wanna ask yourself, why would you want these kinds of consultation platforms to be impl uh, implemented for the purpose of helping uh, the, the, the providers deliver some sort of clinical intervention uh, or healthcare practice, that would be the focus for the intervention. Um, but the rest of these look right on target, so that's terrific. So um, I've mentioned already, evidence-based interventions are the things that we want to see implemented because they improve health outcomes or health behaviors. And implementation strategies are the actions or the deliberate uh, efforts or actions that we can take um, to enhance the adoption, the implementation, or the sustained delivery of evidence-based interventions. They are the stuff that we can do to help people and places do the thing. And I wanna point out here, there's a connection between interventions and health outcomes and implementation strategies and what I'm gonna call implementation outcomes. And by implementation outcomes, that'd be things like adoption, implementation, sustainability, and others that I'm gonna describe in just a few minutes. 
Okay, as I mentioned, we can do all kinds of stuff to help people and places do the thing. Here is a commonly used taxonomy or inventory of implementation strategies called the ERIC compilation. ERIC stands for Expert Recommendations for Implementing Change. And as you can see, these are actions or strategies that do not directly improve health outcomes or health behavior. Rather, they help intervention deliverers like physicians or mental health counselors or community health workers to deliver the intervention with consistency, with quality, or over time, maintaining the um, delivery of that intervention. The ERIC compilation is not an exhaustive taxonomy of implementation strategies. We can do a lot of stuff to help people and places do the thing. The point of this slide is just to emphasize that we can employ implementation strategies at varying levels of influence. At the intrapersonal or individual level of influence, for example, we can employ educational strategies, we can employ reminders, we can employ audit and feedback or decision support, all to help providers or interventional deliverers do the thing with consistency and quality. At the organizational level, we can use quality improvement methods, or we could make service changes, we could make staffing changes, we could revise professional roles, we could do workflow redesign, all to help providers in practice settings to do the thing with consistency and quality, and so on. So you might be wondering, given the wealth of strategies that are available, the wide range of stuff that we can do to help people in places do the thing, how do you select strategies to employ? The answer is that we select strategies to address and overcome the barriers to implementation that operate in the practice settings or the form of settings where implementation is going to occur. In implementation research, we typically conduct formative research to identify those barriers or, uh, or challenges to implementation uh, or implementing that intervention. And then we select implementation strategies to target those barriers. So if providers lack the knowledge and skills to deliver the intervention with consistency, uh, and, consistency and quality, we could select education or training or supervision as strategies to help address that knowledge deficit or skill deficit. If the providers uh, are uncertain about whether to make use of an intervention or they do not have a favorable attitude about using it, we could employ opinion leaders to address this uncertainty or to shape providers' attitudes about the intervention. This distinction between interventions and strategies is closely aligned with the distinction between health outcomes and implementation outcomes. And since you all know what I mean by health outcomes or mental health outcomes, um, I'm gonna focus on implementation outcomes. So implementation outcomes are the effects of deliberate purposeful actions taken to implement uh, evidence-based interventions, new treatments, new practices, new services, and so forth. In other words, they are the effects of implementation strategies. They are the kinds of outcomes that we are trying to uh, address or improve with implementation strategies. Implementation outcomes serve three functions. First, they serve as indicators of implementation success. If I were to ask you, how do you know how well this, this implementation effort is going? How will you measure or assess whether this implementation effort is successful? These are the kinds of outcomes that you would use to gauge that success. Second, they are proxy indicators for implementation processes like the speed of implementation or the ease of implementation. And third, they are intermediate outcomes in relation to service system outcomes like those shown here or health outcomes as well. In a sense, implementation outcomes serve as necessary conditions or preconditions for attaining or achieving or realizing those health outcomes that we desire or anticipate. Uh, you, it's very difficult to get the kind of health outcomes you're looking for from an intervention uh, if implementation is poor, no matter how effective that intervention is. 
And then finally, implementation outcomes are critical for distinguishing intervention failure from implementation failure. So if you do a trial uh, of an intervention and you find that it doesn't seem to improve health, um, you wanna know, is it because the intervention isn't effective or is it because the intervention wasn't implemented well? And so if you don't assess these implementation outcomes, it can be difficult to determine, to distinguish which of these two scenarios is what is causing the, the non-significant uh, effects or results that you, that you observed. So this figure here, it's called the implementation outcomes framework, identifies eight implementation outcomes and distinguishes implementation outcomes from service system outcomes and health outcomes. Let me take a moment to just talk about these implementation outcomes. And again, the distinction between interventions and strategies and, uh, and health outcomes and implementation outcomes is absolutely essential for not only understanding what's distinctive about implementation research compared to effectiveness research, but also really critical for understanding what is going to happen or what you're trying to achieve in a hybrid effectiveness implementation research study, as well as to be able to determine which of the three types of hybrid studies that I'm going to describe later is best suited for, where, for your particular interests. So three of the outcomes that are listed here are perceptual in nature acceptability, appropriateness, and feasibility. They give us some insight into people's experiences with the intervention. And these perceptual implementation outcomes are often assessed in one type of hybrid effectiveness implementation study, specifically the hybrid one study, which I'll say more about shortly. There are two points to note here. First, we can assess the acceptability, we can assess acceptability, appropriateness, and feasibility from the provider's perspective, that is the intervention deliverers, from the patient's perspective, that is the intervention recipients, or from both. And second, we could assess the acceptability, the appropriateness, and feasibility of either the intervention, the implementation strategy, or both. I also want to point out here that cost refers to implementation cost, not cost effectiveness, not cost benefit, just cost or budget impact. Basically, the question here is how much is it going to cost to implement this intervention? Or less commonly, how much is it going to cost to use this implementation strategy to get that intervention implemented? These are often very important questions for potential adopters of an intervention. They want to know what's the budget impact uh, for implementing this intervention. I mentioned earlier that two main outcomes or important outcomes in implementation research focus on how much or how well people and places do the thing. In the implementation outcomes framework shown here, these outcomes are called penetration or service penetration uh, and fidelity. So penetration uh, is typically measured as the percentage of providers who are expected to deliver an intervention who are in fact doing so. So if you expect all of the primary care providers in a, in a particular practice to be um, uh, introducing and, uh, and, using, and, and encouraging their patients to get screened for colorectal cancer, then a good measure of penetration is the percentage of providers who are offering uh, colorectal cancer screening to patients. So another measure here called service penetration, it's a subtype of penetration, uh, is typically measured in terms of the percentage of patients eligible to receive an intervention who in fact do so. So what percentage of patients who are eligible or indicated for colorectal cancer screening are in fact getting screened. Fidelity refers to the degree to which the intervention is implemented as intended or per protocol in terms of say the dosage of the intervention that's delivered, the content of, the deliver of that intervention that's delivered could also refer to the sequencing or even the timing with which that intervention is delivered all of which are commonly um, specified in a, say, a clinical guideline or in a treatment protocol of some type. So a good example here is, are mental health counselors delivering cognitive behavioral therapy completely? And are they doing it well? 
or are they delivering some aspects of cognitive behavioral therapy and not others, or perhaps delivering these intervention components or components of cognitive behavioral therapy with less than optimal levels of skill or quality. Before we move on, I want to point out that there is another commonly used framework for evaluating implementation called REAIM, which stands for REACH, Effectiveness, Adoption, Implementation, and Maintenance. Now, there's a fair amount of overlap between the REAIM framework and the Implementation Outcomes framework that I just discussed. I'll just point out some of the similarities and differences very briefly. REACH is a lot like service penetration in the other framework. Adoption is comparable between the two frameworks, although adoption and re-aim can be assessed like penetration in the implementation outcomes framework. Implementation and re-aim is typically assessed as fidelity, although sometimes re researchers using the re-aim framework will assess implementation in terms of acceptability, appropriateness, and feasibility. And then maintenance is very much like sustainability. Um, maintenance and re-aim is very much like sustainability in the implementation outcomes framework. There are some subtle differences between the implementation outcomes framework and the re-aim framework, but for the purposes of today, you can consider them interchangeable. So the reason I have emphasized, uh, again, the reason why I'm spending so much time on uh, emphasizing interventions and strategies and health outcomes and implementation outcomes is that hybrid effectiveness implementation studies combine these elements. So it's really important to have a firm grasp of them for selecting and designing a hybrid study. So I wanna stop here uh, and just see if there are questions that people have about um, the material that I've covered so far. This I recognize is very foundational, but this foundation is really important for us to have um, before we progress. So if you want, go ahead and come off, uh, off of mute and ask your question. Um, you can also put it in the chat. I'll do my best to monitor that. Hi, Brian. Thanks so much. This is Katrina. Um, and I just, I put in the chat, but I think sometimes I struggle with the difference between adoption and penetration. Um, and I don't know, maybe then I think they re-aim also has this addition, a, de a definition of adoption, which I think confuses me further. So if you have any sort of great insights into like how you think about those and um, any tips there, that'd be great. I think another outcome I also sometimes struggle with is feasibility and how you measure feasibility. So any insights there would also be helpful. Sure, happy to talk about those things, Katrina, and it's nice to see you. Um, so um, adoption is defined as the decision to make use of an intervention. Uh, and it's usually measured uh, as not so much as a decision, but rather as first use of an intervention. Do you see the first indication that somebody is using an intervention, have they adopted it that way? So it's often assessed in a binary format, you know, is like, do we see use or non-use of this particular intervention? Um, it can be measured uh, in, uh, in re-aim. When people use the re-aim framework, they sometimes measure it, not just as sort of a binary indicator of use or non-use of an intervention, but in terms of penetration or like the percentage of clinicians that are using a particular intervention. So it can be measured in that way as well. Um, I typically focus less on adoption as an implementation outcome and much more on penetration or that sort of penetration uh, as, a, as an, in, an outcome, because we really want to know in a community health center or in a health facility, are all of the providers who should be offering or delivering an intervention doing so or only a few? And that gives us a sense for um, how, how widely implemented or how deeply that intervention has penetrated that particular service setting among all the providers who should be delivering that. And then Katrina, I'm sorry, there was a second question. I can't remember what it was. Yeah, the second, that's helpful. Thank you, Brian. The second question was just about um, fidelity and how, or sorry, not fidelity, feasibility. Um, so I feel like sometimes I've seen feasibility presented as sort of like an amalgam, like, you know, you're like, if you have adoption, if you have penetration, if you have these other variables, then you can say that something is feasible, but like, is it distinctive? And we'd just be curious to hear your thoughts on that. Gotcha. Yes, feasibility is often assessed um, in terms of uh, indicators like those that you just mentioned. I would argue that 
um, feasibility is better considered to be a perceptual outcome rather than some sort of observable behavioral outcome of some type. Um, much like, because, because although you may see it implemented, that did not mean it was easy to do or that it's sustainable to do. Um, and so feasibility to me really is a, a, a question of, of uh, judgment or perception about how easy or, or how difficult it would be to do something. And it's not, it, it's, an inf, it's an indirect indicator if you just look at, well, if it was implemented, it must have been feasible. And I, it's sort of like saying, well, if somebody received a service, they must have found it acceptable. I, that, there's an assumption built in there that I think is, is sometimes true, but sometimes, sometimes uh, uh, open for debate. Other questions. Super, super helpful. Thank you. Sure. Other questions about about interventions, implementation strategies, the difference between the two, the distinctions, or between interventions and implementation. Uh, excuse me. Uh, uh, health outcomes and implementation outcomes, or even about any of the particular implementation outcomes that were mentioned here. I can ask a question if. Please. I'll just jump in if that's okay. Um, yes. I, I'm Ivan. Hi, uh, in rehab, rehab medicine. My, my question is about the, the word feasibility. So in my context, often feasibility is used to describe things like acceptability, adherence, and satisfaction to, a, to an intervention, usually in the context of a pilot trial, like a pilot feasibility study. So I, I think I've answered my own question here, but I'm trying to get my head around. Feasibility could mean one of two things. In the scale I just mentioned, it would mean the feasibility of the intervention. That is, uh, did the participants who received it, were they able to complete it? Were they able to engage in it? But in the context of what you're describing, feasibility really is, okay, now take the intervention. Is it feasible to implement it? Is that fair to say? Correct. Um, okay. Implementation research is interested in implementation. And here the question is, how feasible will it be to integrate, to um to introduce or integrate this particular intervention, say, into routine practice, into a particular health setting or school setting or mental health context uh, delivery setting. So intervention uh, feasibility is usually around in feasibility of intervention delivery in implementation research. Feasibility of intervention receipt is sort of a different kind of question, although sometimes we're interested in how feasible it would be for a patient to receive or get access to an intervention. That's also something that we could be interested in, um, but often we wanna know ahead of time uh, uh, or in a context of study, like how feasible is it for the staff in a particular setting, the clinicians uh, to actually deliver that intervention and to integrate it into their routine practice. Thank you. Any other questions before we move forward? There can be, I'll just um, make one more comment. There are things, there's, there are, there's stuff that is clearly, uh, you know, in the category of implementation strategies and it's, it's you know, it's not hard to figure out what, it's not at all. And then there are things that are clearly interventions that are designed to improve health or health outcomes. There are some things that are kind of ambiguous. They could be implementation strategies, they could be interventions. Um, and I'm not gonna, I don't wanna muddy the waters. I'm trying to keep this distinction as clear as we can here um, for the purposes of moving this particular workshop forward. But I just wanted to recognize that there are, circumstances into which we might consider something a strategy or an intervention depending on how we're thinking about it um, but I find that the that the, the that there are two ways to help if you're not sure whether something is a strategy or an intervention there are sort of two uh, criteria or things you can hold on to one is generally speaking implementation strategies are directed toward the intervention deliverers whereas Interventions are directed toward the, the clients, the patients, or the community members whose health outcomes or health behavior are trying to um, change. So one way to, to, if you're not sure, is who's the target of this thing or this action or whatever it is you want to call it that, um, that you're, you're not sure which one it is. So that's one way to kind of sort this. And the second is, is the thing that you're not sure whether it is, uh, is it 
trying, is it designed to really improve health outcomes or health behaviors, or is it designed to, um, to uh, change some sort of implementation outcome? So those are just two sort of criteria that you can use if you're not sure whether something is an intervention or an implementation strategy. Okay, let me move forward. And again, we'll have another opportunity to come back to this question if folks have, uh, if, if new, new issues or new questions or confusions arise. Okay, I said earlier that in a sense, um, implementation research picks up where inter uh, effectiveness or intervention research leaves off. So once we have sufficient evidence to support doing something, then it we, we turn our attention to how do we get the thing integrated into routine practice. So this subway map makes this point clearer. If an intervention hasn't demonstrated efficacy, then we need to do efficacy research or we should seriously consider doing that. Although even at this stage, we should be thinking about implementation issues down the road. If the intervention has demonstrated efficacy under controlled conditions, but not effectiveness under real world conditions, then we need to do or might want to consider doing effectiveness research, perhaps through pragmatic trials. If the intervention has demonstrated effectiveness under real world conditions, then we can move into implementation research. We can do formative implementation research to understand the context of implementation. For example, we could investigate the barriers and facilitators to implementing the intervention. And then we could design and test implementation strategies, perhaps through doing implementation trials where the primary outcomes are how much and how well the intervention is delivered. There are many interventions that are backed by solid evidence and for these interventions, the priority is not evaluating whether the intervention works, but rather testing strategies or methods for getting it done in routine practice or for increasing the rate in which it's done in, reg in routine practice or increasing the quality or the fidelity with which it's done in routine practice. For example, we don't need more effectiveness trials of colorectal cancer screening tests. We know they work. The question now is how do we increase colorectal cancer screening rates, especially in safety net settings where there are real disparities in screening rates? If the intervention has not demonstrated effectiveness under real world conditions, or the evidence is limited either in quantity or in scope, then we could conduct an effectiveness, excuse me, a hybrid effectiveness implementation trial where we ask both a what question and a how question in the same study. Hybrid trials blend design characteristics of effectiveness studies and implementation studies to generate evidence about uh, timely uptake of desirable interventions, to generate evidence about more effective implementation strategies and to provide evidence or information for future scale-up activities. There are three types of hybrid effectiveness implementation study designs. In a hybrid one design, the primary aim is to determine the effectiveness of the intervention. And the secondary aim is to better understand the context of implementation. This design looks and feels a lot like an effectiveness study, but with a twist. We focus primarily on whether the thing works, but we also examine, say, the barriers and facilitators to doing the thing, or how acceptable, feasible, or appropriate the thing is from the perspective of the clinicians, or the patients, or both. In a hybrid three design on the other end of the continuum, the primary aim is, determined, is to determine the impact of an implementation strategy. And the secondary aim is to assess the health outcomes associated with implementing the intervention in the way that it's being implemented in the study. This design looks and feels a lot like a straight up implementation study, but with a twist. We focus primarily on whether the implementation strategy, say, increases how much or how well people and places do the thing. But we also look at whether the thing works as well when implemented this way as it did when we tested it in our effectiveness research. We might do a hybrid three trial 
for example, when we want to implement a thing that has good evidence behind it, but we're going to adapt the thing or implement it in settings or with patients that are different from those that were included in the original effectiveness trials. The more we stray from the evidence base supporting a thing, the more we want to assess whether the thing still works. In a hybrid two trial, it's sort of like the Goldilocks, if you will, the primary aims are dual and twofold. Um, they are uh, to determine whether the thing works and to figure out how to implement the thing. And in a hybrid two trial with these dual aims that are both primary, the sort of equal emphasis given to those two objectives. Here's an example of a hybrid one trial. The primary aim is to evaluate the clinical effectiveness of a digital diabetes prevention program versus a small group diabetes prevention in class. The primary clinical outcome was assessment of hemoglobin A1C and the secondary clinical outcomes were weight loss and cardiovascular risk factor reduction. These outcomes were measured at baseline four months and 12 months. So this sounds a lot like sort of an intervention trial or an effectiveness trial, but there's a secondary aim here that makes it a hybrid one trial. The secondary aim is to assess the potential for future adoption, implementation, and sustain the sustainability of the diabetes, the digital version of the diabetes prevention program within a regional healthcare system. So the researchers in this study used REAIM to guide this assessment, and they collected both quantitative data and qualitative data, specifically through key informant interviews with organizational administrators and primary care physicians about um, issues related to uh, you know, what it would take to kind of uh, uh, adopt this and scale it and implement it and sustain it on a wider scale across the regional healthcare system. So they wanted to know something a little bit more about the implementation context um, to guide future scale-up activities. So here's an example of a hybrid two study. This study uh, employed a cluster randomized trial design uh, to achieve two aims. First, to evaluate the effectiveness and cost effectiveness of trauma-focused cognitive behavioral therapy in schools versus an enhanced treatment as usual condition. And secondarily, or uh, also I should say number two, to evaluate the impact and cost effectiveness of BASIS versus attention control. And BASIS is the branded uh, named sort of implementation strategy. It's a bundle of implementation strategies called BASIS. So in this study, trauma-focused CBT is the evidence-based intervention. Its effectiveness is uh, compared to treatment as usual, is assessed in terms of youth mental health outcomes like PTSD symptoms, depression, psychosocial functioning, and so forth. And basis, as I mentioned earlier, is the implementation strategy. It's actually a, a multi-component strategy that combines education, social influence, and mo motivational interviewing to target school mental health clinicians' attitudes subjective norms and self-efficacy to deliver trauma-focused CBT. Note, these strategies are targeting the intervention deliverers as opposed to the intervention recipients. And the goal is to really target those aspects, their attitudes, subjective norms, and self-efficacy to deliver the trauma-focused CBT in the school setting. Um, in addition uh, to those components, uh, action planning and problem solving are also added to help maintain the school mental health counselors, uh, clinicians self-efficacy to deliver that intervention over time. So the effectiveness of the basis strategy is being assessed in this study in terms of the following implementation outcomes. Uh, trauma uh, adoption of trauma-focused CBT by school mental health counselors, um, or clinicians, the fidelity with which they're delivering trauma-focused CBT, and their sustained or main, maintained delivery of trauma-focused CBT over a period of time, over time. The researchers will also examine the costs and the cost effectiveness of BASIS as an implementation strategy for helping school mental health clinicians deliver trauma-focused CBT with quality and consistency over time. 
remember earlier I said cost in as an implementation outcome is usually assessed in terms of the, the cost of implementing the intervention. Um, but it can also be uh, assessed in terms of the cost of using an implementation strategy. That's what's going on here. And finally, here's an example of a hybrid three study. Interestingly, this study employed a quasi-experimental design rather than an experimental design, specifically an interrupted time series design. Here, the primary aim is to determine if implementation facilitation leads to uptake and sustained use of primary care integrated uh, pain support or PIPs. It's a collaborative clinical care program. Implementation facilitation is an implementation strategy. I won't go into the details about how they operationalized uh, implementation facilitation in this particular study. I'll simply note that the effectiveness of implementation facilitation in this study was assessed using the REAIM framework. That is the researchers assessed whether implementation facilitation increased the reach, the adoption, the implementation and the maintenance of PIPs, this collaborative clinical care program. The secondary aim was to assess the effectiveness of PIPs on clinical outcomes, including transitions to safer medication regimens, as well as the uptake of complementary and integrated health treatments. And uptake in this particular study was defined as patient receipt of a complementary and integrated health treatment appointment. Note that the third aim is also an implementation focused aim rather than an effectiveness aim. Many implementation science studies include an analysis of the cost of implementing an evidence-based intervention. As I mentioned earlier, this is often crucial information for would-be implementers. Organizational leaders wanna know how much is it going to cost to implement the thing? They don't care about cost effectiveness, how, how cost effectiveness, how cost effective the thing is from a, say a societal perspective or a payer perspective, what they wanna know is what's the budget impact for, of implementing this particular thing. So those are the three types. Uh, these three studies, I think, illustrate the three types of hybrid studies that one can conduct. Again, hybrid studies are, they're not really a new study design, but rather a way in which to conduct effectiveness research and implementation research within, the same, within a single study. And the principal differences among the three types is the relative emphasis on the effectiveness research question and the implementation research question. And one of the things that I really like about and think is really valuable or appealing about these hybrid effectiveness implementation research designs is that they can help us move, translate research into practice more quickly by uh, addressing implementation research questions and effectiveness research questions in the same study. So instead of conducting the effectiveness research, you know, getting your five-year R1, conducting that effectiveness research, determining that this is effective, and then and then and only then applying for and then getting uh, another R01 to look at the implementation of this such that we've now stretched this translational process over a 10 year period or even longer, uh, that's assuming you get lucky and you get funded right away. Um, we can kind of accelerate or condense this translational process by incorporating or integrating these two types of, um, of, of research into a single study. And likewise, as we adapt or uh, move an intervention into different settings or different populations than those that were originally uh, included in our effectiveness studies, we can um, really focus on how best to get these things implemented, but also can continue to add evidence uh, to the evidence base about the effectiveness of that intervention um, for different populations and for in or in different settings or when they it's been adapted in some important way. So we continue to contribute effectiveness data. There are other differences among the three types that are listed here. And this is a, a pretty busy slide. So I'm just going to point out a few differences. So um, first you can see here, the, the three, the, as I mentioned already, the three types really differ in terms of the relative emphasis given to the effectiveness research aim or question and the, uh, and the implementation research aim or question. 
um, with hybrid ones really emphasizing effectiveness, hybrid threes really emphasizing implementation, and hybrid two kind of combining a, or having a dual emphasis on this. And you can see the sort of generically worded kinds of research questions, the general state, generally stated research questions that we might we might ask across these three different types. Um, it's not always the case that um, hybrid studies use experimental designs, although they often do. Um, and but when you do see uh, hybrid designs using uh, experimental research designs, you can kind of see how they differ across these three different types. Um, not surprisingly, in that hybrid one space, uh, where uh, the effectiveness of the intervention is really the primary research question, we're more likely to see um, uh, individual or participant randomized control trials uh, with patients, uh, often as the, the unit of randomization. Um, often the comparison condition is going to be some sort of placebo condition or more likely uh, treatment as usual or maybe a competing treatment. Um, and again, uh, and, and contrast that, for example, with the hybrid three designs on the other end of the spectrum where we're really interested more in in uh, assessing the effectiveness or the impact of implementation strategies, um, but we still want to collect some data and, and, and find out about clinical outcomes as well. Um, you can see, sort of see here, the these sorts of designs uh, or studies, when they use experimental research designs, are much more likely to use randomized control designs of some type or other sorts of cluster randomized trials designs of some type, although there can be some variations there. And usually those cluster randomized trial designs um, you know, have units of randomizations at the provider or the clinical unit or even higher units like facilities or systems and so forth. Um, the comparisons are often uh, either implementation as usual uh, for example, if the intervention's already being delivered in the comparison uh, uh, clinics or settings um, and your implementation, your hybrid three trials, really testing strategies to see, can we increase the delivery of this evidence-based intervention by employing these particular implementation strategies? So this would be a great example for, uh, uh, of looking to see, say, if implementation facilitation as an implementation strategy increases the rates of colorectal cancer screening uh, in federally qualified health centers, there's already um, some level of colorectal cancer screening occurring in all of the FQHCs or federally qualified health centers in, in the study that you might recruit. But you may be looking to see if implementation facilitation helps to increase the rates of, of uh, uh, colorectal cancer screening in the intervention sites, so to speak, compared to the, to the usual uh, implementation as usual sites in the control condition. Um, other points that are, I think are worth mentioning here. Uh, yes, in the hybrid two, the randomizations and the comparisons um, can really vary depending on the research needs and conditions. So perhaps the strongest and clearest example of a hybrid two trial would be a two by two factorial randomized trial, but these are pretty uncommon. Uh, usually the randomization uh, in a hybrid two is either for the implementation or excuse me, for the intervention or for the implementation strategy, but not for both. So an example of a hybrid two trial that does use a, a, a factorial design is, is one called the, the healthy bones study. And um, it, here um, there was, uh, there were both uh, patient directed uh, uh, interventions as well as physician directed uh, strategies for fracture prevention that were tested simultaneously. Um, and and in, in, in the, the, the clinical intervention or the intervention here was sort of patient education and the patient intervention or strategy, excuse me, the imp implementation strategy was academic detailing. And so they used that two by two design to really, um, uh, and randomized uh, both uh, uh, patients and uh, clinicians uh, into these uh, two different kinds of conditions in the same study. But again, that sort of uh, two by two factorial uh, randomized trial design is pretty uncommon. Usually randomization is either for the intervention or for the strategy, but not both. And I can get into some of the details about that in a, in a few minutes as we go further. Okay, now's another good point to stop and see if there are questions before we proceed. So I'm gonna put this back up here. Uh, 
in case people want to ask more specific questions. And again, please feel free to put your questions in the chat uh, or come off camera uh, or off mute and, uh, and ask your question. And please don't be shy. There's probably a very good chance that if you have a question, uh, there are others also in this workshop who have the same question. I, I have a question. This is sure. Sarah Roberts. Um, thanks, Brian. Sure. Um, I, I'm curious about, um, in the sort of branching diagram you showed earlier, you talked about, um, you know, establishing that an intervention has like clinical efficacy before moving into effectiveness research. Um, and I wondered if you um, have any thoughts about the for, for interventions that are less um, clinically oriented and maybe more behaviorally oriented or systems oriented, whether um, there's, I, I think I've observed a bit of a trend towards moving straight into effectiveness research, thinking that, you know, it doesn't really matter if it works in a perfect setting and can we just test immediately whether, you know, the effectiveness and implementation outcomes kind of straight away. And I wondered if you could speak to that. Yeah, sure. Um, so I just in full disclosure here, I am a healthcare focused implementation scientist. Um, I was a health services researcher uh, for much of my career before I got into implementation science. Uh, and I work mostly with clinicians uh, who uh, or in clinical settings with clinical kinds of interventions. Um, so and this slide, while I'm borrowing it uh, from one of my from some of my colleagues, they're also sort of taking that perspective as well. You're absolutely right. Um, there's a real in, especially in health promotion and, and complex uh, behavioral or social interventions, we skip the efficacy stage and we move straight into the effectiveness stage, uh, effectiveness trials or uh, effectiveness studies. That's perfectly appropriate. You know, we definitely want to to do that efficacy. You know, when the when there's a uh, um, when there are risks involved, uh, and we want to really manage those risks and make sure we understand them uh, and we can modulate them before we sort of move this into the effectiveness. Um, uh, arena. So that point could be could be skipped. But I, what I wanted to emphasize in this particular slide is even when I talk with folks who are saying, you know, doing uh, early phase clinical trials of, of, an inter, of a clinical intervention, you, you still want to be thinking uh, even at that early stage about designing or making sure that this intervention is implementable <laughs> at the end of the day. Because um, it doesn't do any good to show in your efficacy trials that this is highly efficacious, but it's dead on arrival, so to speak, because there's no way it could be implemented in anything other than academic medical centers with highly trained specialized personnel. So, I, you know, just have encourage people to really think about um, the, the form um, in which that, you know, it could like if it's injection, you know, if it involves injections, you know, uh, that's going to be a limitation as to how far, how implementable this is going to be in certain settings. So likewise, if the treatment regimen is highly complex and requires a high level of skill, that still may be a very valuable one, but it's worth thinking through, is there anything we can do to make this a little bit more feasible to implement elsewhere? Thanks so much. Sure. What I like about this slide and what I try to encourage is a lot of the uh, folks that I work with in the intervention space um, want to do effectiveness trials. They're focused really on intervention development and testing, um, and they, you know, they 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 maybe are have uh, have had, um, amenable to doing a sort of a pragmatic effectiveness trial, which is great. Um, and I would usually encourage them to say, you know, if you're going to do an effectiveness trial of your intervention, consider doing a hybrid one. Um, why not add an aim to your study where you learn a little bit? It's still, you can still focus on effectiveness. You can still have your trained research staff or clinicians delivering this intervention under pretty controlled conditions. Um, and so that you can really detect the effect or to get the signal of effectiveness out of that design. But why not add an, uh, a, an, an implementation aim as a secondary aim to your study so that we can learn something more from that study than just was it effective, yes or no? Um, because that's helpful, but it doesn't really provide a lot of the answers that we would need about how to then to move it beyond the effectiveness context or effectiveness trial context into routine practice. So why not? ask the providers, for example, 
what was your experience like with this? Was this acceptable? Was it, you know, was it feasible to do? What feasibility issues might come up if you were to do this, you know, uh, on your own or with existing staff and resources? How easy or difficult would this be to to integrate this into your routine practice? Um, uh, and likewise, we might ask similar kinds of questions even on the parts of the patients that are there. You know, how acceptable was it to receive this and so forth? Because an intervention that um, that that providers just don't like uh, or, or they don't think is appropriate, they're not going to adopt and continue to use that or maintain delivery of it, no matter how effective it is. So it's helpful to have that kind of information ahead of time. Um, and we can learn something by adding uh, an, an, a secondary and sort of implementation aim to our, to our usual sort of effectiveness studies. Let's see, there's another question here. Within clinical settings, should I consider implementing quality improvement initiative under PDSA cycle as implementation research or only the S study part of PDSA cycle should be considered an implementation research study? So that's a good question. Um, there's a, uh, there definitely a relationship between quality improvement and implement, uh, quality improvement uh, and implementation research. They're not the same thing. I will say that many implementation studies use quality improvement as an implementation strategy, um, but the goals of implementation research or implementation science and the goals of uh, quality improvement are different. Um, stated in the in the most basic terms, you know, quality improvement is usually about solving a local problem, generating local knowledge uh, and local solutions to solve a local problem, and its goal is not to generate to generate evidence or or knowledge that is applicable or generalizable beyond the setting in which the the the, uh, the activity is taking place, that's in contrast to implementation research where we really do want to to try to generate evidence or knowledge that is useful outside the particular study in which that evidence is collected, um, and because we have that aim, that objective, that aspiration, we tend to employ designs, study designs that allow us to uh, feel more confident um, uh, that the information is going to be internally valid, but also to really consider sort of external validity kinds of considerations in the study's design. So they tend to have different foci or different fields to different a different feel to them, even though they can be blended in certain ways. It's a great question and certainly happy to talk with you more um, offline about sort of how one can uh, integrate you know, quality improvement activities and implementation research into, um, you know, in, in the same, in, in, in interesting ways. Other questions? Brian, uh, this is Brian Flaherty, and I'm just pointing out there was a question in the chat before the one you just answered also. Sorry, I have the oh, no problem. No problem. minimized here. Uh, I'm wondering whether these study designs are broadly uh, understood by grant reviewers or do they need to be defined in most cases? Thinking about grant writing. Um, great question. And the answer is it depends. Um, there are study sections at the NIH uh, that focus exclusively or primarily on implementation science. And for those, those study designs are well understood. And it's very helpful, I think, to use this language to describe them. Uh, and to say I'm conducting a hybrid two or a hybrid three and, and so forth. For other study sections where uh, that sort of implementation science expertise or familiarity is going to be less prevalent, um, I probably would not identify the designs or use the sort of language of hybrid, uh, of hybrid one, hybrid two, hybrid three in the specific aims page. Why introduce terms in that, you know, in that very limited real estate um, that people might not be familiar with, where you don't really have an opportunity, you don't have the line space to really explain or describe it in more detail. So I typically don't. I would just say we're going to look at the effectiveness and implementation of this, uh, uh, you know, of this intervention and aim one, you know, and, and then just list the aims uh, uh, as you might. Later, uh, when I get into the approach, um, I would probably um, make it clear that I'm conducting a hybrid design and I might even describe which of the three designs. And because in that uh, part of the proposal, you have a few more lines to sort of elaborate a little bit to bring the reviewers along in case they're not already familiar with this language. I hope that's helpful. Other questions? 
I, I don't want to rush things, but I'm happy to move forward. Let me push this back up. Um, and for those who are going to stick around for the workshoppy part of this, <laughs> we'll see this table again or form of it. Actually, you should have it in your um, in the email uh, in the worksheets that were emailed to you, or at least a version of this. Terrific. I'm going to move forward, but again, we're going to have an opportunity for questions to come up. So let me switch now, having described what hybrid effectiveness implementation uh, studies are like as a general category, uh, and then having talked a little bit about the three types and, 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 and their features that might distinguish among them, let me switch uh, to talking a little bit about uh, the criteria that you might use for selecting which of the three types of hybrids you might want to do. And there are really four criteria to consider here. The first is the sort of is the level of evidence for the intervention. Second is the extent to which the intervention is expected to be adapted for context for population or both. The third is the extent to which you have knowledge already about implementation barriers and facilitators in the settings where the implementation is going to take place. And the fourth is the extent to which the implementation, there are implementation strategies that are sort of ready to be evaluated. And these um, four criteria can be translated into four questions, which are listed here. I'm going to walk through each of these questions in the next few slides. And then when we get to the workshop part of this, um, which we'll transition to shortly, you know, we'll actually work through these questions with, the, uh, um, with respect to the, the kind of study that you're thinking about doing. OK, so the first question you want to ask yourself when you're trying to figure out, yes, I want to do a hybrid effectiveness implementation study. Should I do a hybrid one, a hybrid two, or a hybrid three? The first question you want to ask yourself is, how solid is the evidence base for the intervention? If the evidence supporting the intervention is pretty solid or very solid, and you don't anticipate having to adapt the intervention in a significant way, then you might consider a hybrid three or a hybrid two study. You kind of want to be more on that uh, hybrid three end of the continuum. Um, a good example of this might be, uh, for example, that there's very solid evidence for uh, pre-exposure prophylaxis or PrEP as a prevention uh, intervention for a uh, an intervention for um, preventing somebody from uh, uh, acquiring an HIV infection. Um, we have really solid evidence for PrEP. Um, likewise, another one, and again, forgive me, I, 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 I do a lot of work uh, in cancer, so many of my examples will be cancer focused. We also have really good evidence that uh, vaccination for uh, HPV uh, is very effective. Um, and, and not just for preventing HPV infections, but also for preventing uh, a whole range of cancers. And uh, the evidence just seems to get stronger every day. Um, and so for these sorts of interventions, we have really a solid evidence base. And so we're, you know, we, we, we probably don't need yet another study to say, are, do these, are these effective? We really want to know is, how do we get more people uh, 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 vaccinated for HPV, uh, uh, more people with uh, more HPV vaccinations done, or more folks who would benefit from PrEP uh, to get PrEP. Um, so if we don't anticipate uh, adapting that intervention in any significant way, we might make some minor adaptations to the way it's described or how it's packaged or something like that. Then we could either do a straight implementation trial or more likely we wanna also do, um, maybe we wanna do a hybrid three kinds of study where we're really focused on that implementation uh, question of how we get more people on PrEP or how we get more folks, vac more adolescents vaccinated, but we may still wanna collect some health outcome data as well along the way, uh, just to contribute, uh, to make sure that that intervention is still working um, when we implement it in these new settings or these populations or uh, and so forth, and to continue to contribute to that evidence base. Now, if the evidence base is mixed uh, or there are important gaps in the evidence base, then you kind of want to gravitate more to the hybrid one end of the continuum and consider a hybrid one or maybe a hybrid two kind of study. 
Um, second, you want to ask yourself how much you expect the intervention will need to be adapted for where you want to study it. Again, we can adapt, and sometimes we have to adapt an intervention when we deploy it in a different practice setting or with a different population um, than those in, that were in, uh, in which the intervention was evaluated in our effectiveness studies, the, the studies that produce the evidence that it improves health outcomes or health behavior. So if we expect there's only going to be uh, a little bit of adaptation, we might just change uh, the graphics or the language or the examples, say in our patient education materials of some type or um, you know, minor adjustments and so forth, then we might want to consider you know, moving more uh, into the sort of type three space or down at the type three end of the continuum. Um, we might want to include an adaptation process in, uh, as an aim, say a specific aim one uh, in, our in, our, in, in our grant applications, saying that we will take this, we're not going to take this intervention off the shelf and implement it. We're going to make some changes to it to make it either, say, a little bit more feasible or acceptable uh, for doing in a particular setting, uh, or uh, maybe a little more culturally relevant uh, for a different population um, than those than those who've been receiving this intervention in our effectiveness trials. So we kind of drift more toward that uh, hybrid three end of the continuum. Now, if we do expect that we're gonna make some pretty fundamental adaptations, some real fundamental revisions to this uh, intervention, then we really wanna gravitate more toward that hybrid one end of the continuum because now the questions of like, we've made some pretty significant adaptations to this. We, we probably want to make sure that this thing is effective. You know, we can't just lean on the effectiveness evidence for the previously for that we previously collected if we're going to make substantial changes to that intervention. The third question to consider is how much you already know about the implementation barriers and facilitators for the intervention in the settings or in the context where you anticipate implementing and evaluating the implementation of. If you really don't know much about the what implementation barriers and facilitators or challenges you might arise in that practice setting or that practice that implementation context, um, and you you really kind of want more effectiveness data. Uh, for the intervention, then you want to gravitate more toward that hybrid one end of the continuum, you know, where the implementation aim focuses on where, where effectiveness is really kind of given primary emphasis, um, but you're going to use that implementation aim uh, to sort of assess what are some of those barriers and facilitators to moving this into routine practice or outside of this sort of controlled context in which, um, in which intervention delivery and receipt is taking place in your sort of um, hybrid one or uh, uh, kind of study. Um, if the effectiveness data are strong, and you know enough about implementation barriers and challenges, perhaps there have already been studies of similar kinds of interventions uh, in say uh, health facilities or in schools uh, or in primary care practices and so forth. So we kind of have a sense for what are the likely implementation challenges or maybe even implementation facilitators that are gonna be operating those settings. We have enough kind of information uh, already to select implementation strategies to evaluate then we can gravitate more toward that hybrid three end of the continuum. Again, although you may want to do, depending on the circumstances, a hybrid two, um, depending on how much you still want to uh, collect uh, evidence around effectiveness and, and contribute to the evidence base. And then fourth and finally, you want to ask yourself how ready you are to evaluate real world implementation, a real world implementation strategy or some sort of package or bundle of strategies. You know, if, so if you're not really ready yet, um, then a hybrid one uh, is probably indicated where you, you sort of collect more information about implementation barriers and facilitators to help you prepare for developing the implementation strategies for a later study. Um, if you do feel like you are ready, uh, but you still want to collect or need to focus on uh, the intervention effectiveness, you still need more data there, uh, and that's really important, then you want to consider a hybrid two. Um, if you really are ready uh, and your effectiveness data are pretty strong, um, and you don't really need to adapt a whole lot, then you want to uh, gravitate more toward the hybrid three end of the continuum. A couple more points before we um, take more questions and take a break. So having decided which type of hybrid study 
you want to conduct, then it's time to think about the study designs. And as I mentioned earlier, hybrid studies often employ experimental designs. Uh, NIH loves to fund experimental designs, um, but it's not it's not always the case that you see hybrid studies using them, and it is possible to do hybrid studies without them. And there could actually be some utility in using, say, quasi-experimental designs as an alternative. So hybrid one study uh, studies most commonly use that participant level randomized trial uh, design that I mentioned earlier, because the emphasis really is on uh, to develop, to have it really internally valid a test or evaluation of the effectiveness of the intervention versus a control condition, which like I said before, could be no intervention or usual care or wait list control, um, any of those permutations would be fine. It, it is sometimes the case though that you may need to use a cluster randomized uh, design or maybe you wanna use a step wedge trial design uh, in a hybrid one uh, kind of study. A lot of it just has to do with how much clustering there is, what your concerns are for potential uh, contamination uh, between the intervention and control groups uh, and so forth, but typically, um, they look a lot like effectiveness studies um, with that sort of individual level randomized trial designs. Um, with the focus on, um, I will skip over here to the other end of the continuum. So for hybrid three type designs, these are usually cluster randomized designs of some type. They might be parallel cluster randomized trial designs. They might be step wedge trial designs. There might be factorial adaptive trial designs and all that, because typically uh, you are concerned about uh, 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 clustering there, uh, certainly for patients, um, but also potentially for providers, but you really want to align the unit of randomization and the and the uh, unit of analysis or unit or level of analysis with the level at which the implementation strategy is going to be deployed. So if it's going to be, if the implementation strategy is going to target providers, you know, then they should be, it should be cluster randomized around the provider level. Or if it's going to be at the practice level, um, primary care practices or um, uh, federally qualified health centers, they might serve as sort of the clusters in a cluster randomized kind of design. And as I mentioned before, with uh, hybrid twos, the sort of strongest hybrid two kinds of design uh, or, or an, an optimal kind of design would be one of these two by two factorials where you've got randomizations happening at, at different levels um, with different units. But that's pretty uncommon to see. More often, um, uh, you'll you'll see um, uh, randomization taking place either for the intervention, which is typically going to be at that patient level randomization, uh, or at the uh, at, um, at the um, unit that's receiving or targeted for the implementation strategy, which is more likely to be uh, sort of that cluster randomized design. Um, so that it can really kind of vary. And I'll have more to say about that hybrid two. Those are actually the most challenging ones, I think, to really design and think through. Um, uh, more, It's a lot easier to sort of grasp and think about and conduct sort of hybrid ones and hybrid threes. Uh, just continuing this thought here, um, hybrid one trials, not surprising, would are uh, with their emphasis on effectiveness and health outcomes and so forth, are going to be powered on participant level health outcomes. The power for implementation outcomes is, if 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 they are assessed in that secondary aim, uh, is usually rarely considered. Most of the time, when implementation outcomes are assessed in a hybrid one, like how acceptable, how feasible, how appropriate the perceptions of those kinds of things, uh, or um, uh, potentially other implementation outcomes. Usually those implementation outcomes in hybrid one trials are, are assessed and analyzed in a more descriptive way. Um, in a hybrid two uh, trial, it could be, like I said, powered on the health outcome or the implementation outcome or both, depending on the research design. Um, when they're dual randomized, I just offered up that particular example. But usually um, uh, you must, like I said, these, these two, two by two factorial randomized designs are pretty uncommon due to feasibility issues and resource issues. Um, sometimes it's simply not logical to do one. Um, so usually uh, um, you have to decide which outcome you're going to power your hybrid two study on. And, and they can take kind of two forms. Jeff Curran, who's sort of the, the mayor of, of Hybridville, as he likes to describe himself as somebody who sort of put this article out and put 
hybrid uh, designs on the map back in 2012 and has since become the, the hybrid, uh, the mayor of Hybridville oh, over time, described said most hybrid two studies kind of take one of two forms. Uh, one form is sort of a, a person level randomized trial where the implementation strategies are used sort of universally uh, across uh, the, the intervention and comparison conditions. And this is sort of a, essentially a, a pilot study or feasibility study of the strategies for um, supporting a hybrid trial. Uh, or the other form it can take is sort of a, a single arm study where, of both an intervention and implementation pr approach sort of within a, a pre post configuration. So a sort of non-experimental or maybe quasi experimental kind of design. Um, as I mentioned earlier, um, uh, you can use quasi-experimental designs. You can use non-randomized trial designs. You can even use observational designs in these hybrid uh, to, to do hybrid effectiveness implementation studies. Jeff Curran points out, uh, for example, that a, a well-designed um, that, that well-designed observational, non-randomized or even rollout kinds of studies uh, can be really of great utility, particularly in the rollout of public health or community programs. So although the original 2012 article that he described really focused on uh, the three types of hybrids using experimental design methods um, uh, and experimental de research designs. And you see a lot of hybrid studies funded by NIMH using the experimental research designs for all the reasons we've talked about before. Um, you can use quasi-experimental designs or even non-randomized or observational kinds of designs to conduct this kind of research. It's just less often seen. Okay, that was a whole bunch of information. Uh, I'm going to stop here again and ask if people have questions um, uh, about the three types of hybrid designs, the kinds of criteria uh, that you would want to, or questions you'd want to ask to help you figure out which of these types you want to conduct, and maybe some of the design features of the different types. Yes, please go ahead, uh, Julie. Hi, Brian. Thanks. I I think you sort of answered this, but I'm still trying to think through it. If you have an intervention that has a lot of evidence, but in a very specific setting like clinics, and you want to look at it outside of clinics where it has not been studied before, mm -hmm. um, or you have something that's been studied extensively for one set of health conditions, but not another, I'm wondering how you would think, think through the hybrid designs most effective in those two situations. So a good question would be, how much adaptation to that intervention do you think you're going to have to make when you move from that first from the setting from the from the setting of origin where you collected all that uh, that evidence about its effectiveness to the target setting or the setting you want to transport it to so you know um, moving an intervention from an academic medical center to a community based primary care practice you know, you have to decide, well, is this intervention going to have to be adapted in some way for it to be delivered, you know, in a community primary care practice? And some, or is there enough similarity between the two um, that it can probably be um, ad uh, uh, implemented with relatively minimal adaptation? Then, and those kinds of decisions may be based on things like their staffing, their resources, and so forth, and whether or not you need to adjust the, the intervention in some way for doing that. When, because I work a lot with sort of clinical interventions in that sort of healthcare space, we don't see a whole lot of adaptation um, uh, of interventions. You know, we, we really want uh, and aspire to having uh, healthcare providers or clinicians delivering these interventions. Uh, uh, in a guideline concordant way. We don't want them making <laughs> adaptations. Uh, and so we sort of emphasize the fidelity of intervention delivery a lot more, say, than my colleagues who work in the mental health or behavioral sp space or with complex social interventions, where the likelihood that you're going to be able to take an intervention off the shelf and implement it um, is pretty low because the resources that are available, the staffing, the staffing levels, the staffing skills, the patients or the clients that are seen in those settings are probably pretty darn different than those that were included in the NIH funded trials where we developed that evidence. And so you can probably bet your bottom dollar, you're gonna be making some adaptations to this. And the question is, are you making uh, adaptations to the core components or what I would call deep adaptations 
where you're making fundamental changes to the intervention, or are you making more peripheral kinds of adaptations or surface little adaptations? You know, again, if you're really changing what we would think of the active ingredients or what we think are the active ingredients of that intervention, then you probably want to gravitate more toward the uh, hybrid one end of the continuum because you've made you want to see, okay, now that we've changed it up in a pretty significant way, are we, does it still work? Is it still, is, is, is it effective? If we're just talking about changing surface level features, that's a different story. But this is, can be a real judgment call. For example, um, if we want the intervention to be delivered, uh, if we want the intervention to be delivered not by a health professional, but by a community health worker. So the intervention's the same, but the delivery agent, the agent delivering the intervention is going to change. You know, you have to ask yourself: Is this going to? Is this likely to cause uh, adaptations to that intervention? And is, am I going to need to worry about the fidelity with which that intervention is being delivered when community health workers do it compared to when health professionals do it? So in that case, you probably do want to look. You do anticipate that there could be a voltage drop, if you will, in how effective that intervention is possibly as a result of varying levels of fidelity with which they deliver the intervention. I don't know if I answered your question, Julie. Hopefully I did. You did. Thank you. Other questions? Yes, Brian. Thanks. I, I of course, want to give people other people time, but if nobody's asking, um, I'm involved in designing or uh, helping randomize for a trial, and I think it would be called a type one hybrid trial. And I'm wondering if you're aware of situations where work is being done to stratify and match, you know, for the effectiveness part, you know, to try to make a really good comparison and control for covariates. Um, where you work hard on that for the effectiveness part, and that adversely impacts your ability to assess the implementation outcomes. I mean, is that possible? Or you, what, what do you think about that? Uh, it, it would, if it certainly does, to the extent that when you really are powering the study to look at those kinds of issues, um, then you're probably going to have to sacrifice, you're probably sacrificing some power to address some of the implementation outcomes or outcomes that are going to be assessed at a higher unit uh, or higher level of analysis because you're going to have fewer of them. You're not randomizing in that way. So yeah, that's why I'm saying sometimes we have to make these sort of trade-offs in the hybrid two. The Goldilocks perfect ideal situation is a two by two factorial, but when that isn't happening and you really have to make a choice, you know, uh, about how you're going to power your study and what level of randomization you're going to do, then there, you're, you're inevitably going to face some trade-offs in that regard. And so in that sense, the, uh, the implementation strategies are probably being evaluated more for, do they appear to work? Uh, are they feasible to do? Do they show promise? Do we see sort of good, maybe not perfectly powered, um, but good sort of reasonably good power and, and descriptively, do we see the kinds of outcomes, implementation outcomes that we want to see? So yeah. you could still collect some useful information, even though it, it not, it, you, you're not perfectly set up to, to evaluate those implementation questions. Okay. Thank you. So um, let's take a break here uh, for five minutes so that people can um, get up and use the bathroom, refresh their coffee. And for those who have said, that's really interesting, but I'm not sure I'm interested in, you know, in actually conducting or designing a hybrid study. This would be a great opportunity to, for you to kind of, uh, hop off the call. And for those of you who are interested in uh, to the workshopping part of this, come back in five minutes. Uh, we'll do that in five minutes or so. And uh, we'll move into the sort of uh, group uh, guided activity for, for designing one, for deciding which hybrid study uh, is right for you, and then helping to think through some of the design features of the study that, that you choose. So we'll take five here. Actual workshopping, a, uh, a hybrid study design of a topic of, your, of interest to you. So um, good to have you hanging out here. Hopefully this can be interactive. Um, I really want to kind of guide you through um, uh, 
the questions or criteria for figuring out which hybrid study is right for you, uh, which of these three types, and then also to help you think through some of the features for the design features of the study that, uh, that would work for you. So hopefully you have received the email uh, that included the worksheets that we're going to work through here uh, over the next uh, hour or so, um, for as long as those of you want to hang out. Um, so I want to uh, first begin, like I did before, with asking you uh, to consider the intervention or the thing that you want to see implemented. Remember, the intervention in implementation research is the thing that improves health outcomes or health behaviors. So like cognitive behavioral therapy is the thing, is an intervention, but training mental health providers to do cognitive behavioral therapy is not an intervention, as we'd use the term. Um, it's a strategy. So if you would please um, but just put in the chat one more check for me here about uh, what the uh, intervention or thing is that you would like to see implemented. Just to make sure we don't have uh, um, uh, any confusion or, or uh, ambiguity about that. So again, if you're just coming back on, if you could just put in the chat what the thing or the intervention is that you'd like to see implemented. Collaborative care for mental health, that's a good one. Interestingly, Julie, um, I, I tried to distinguish as much as I can between what's and how's or between interventions and implementation strategies, but programs, um, one of the seven Ps, they are interventions, but programs, unlike say clinical uh, interventions, uh, tend to blend a little bit of what's and how's, like the collaborative care model uh, is not just about what's being delivered, but the particular model or who delivers what and how they work together. Um, but we can still focus on collaborative uh, care for mental health as the thing we want to see implemented. Um, and that's really a great question to focus on. Uh, how can we get collaborative care for mental health implemented and implemented well in settings? It's a great question to ask after you've already established that collaborative care models for mental health result in improved mental health outcomes for, for the patients that are exposed to or, or receive that uh, or participate in that model. Let's see, provision of gender affirming medical care, perfect prep, yep, collaborative care and rehab. Again, same point I just mentioned about Julie. Um, we can definitely do implementation research or hybrid de uh, uh, designs with models of care being the thing. Referral pathways, yep, that will work too um, uh, for community-based exercise programs. Um, we could uh, do implementation research to see whether referral pathways, um, uh, uh, I'm sorry, this is a great question about, uh, um, about what the thing is here. Um, the community-based exercise programs can be the thing we want to see implemented uh, and referral pathways could be the strategy that we use to do that, and that may be a better way for thinking about, about this particular study. And you'll see why in just a moment. Um, to early stages, re-entry for programs from prison to community programs with cognitive disabilities. That'd be great, Mark, if um, if you have a sense that, um, uh, that re-entry programs would help improve uh, uh, the health and well-being of folks who have cognitive disabilities. Um, if we don't have a lot of evidence yet for reentry programs, you, you may want to be gravitating more toward the hybrid one end. But yes, that'll work. Brief alpha call interventions, point of care testings, these all look good. Okay, so now let's consider the questions I posed earlier uh, for selecting the type of hybrid study uh, that's appropriate uh, to conduct at this point in time. And again, this is a bit of a judgment call um, uh, of these various questions. So there's no one right answer, as you can see, there's a um, uh, uh, from from the slides that I'm that we've got up here. So that first question you want to think about is what's the nature of the effectiveness data for the intervention of interest? You know, if if um, there isn't a whole lot of evidence, meaning there haven't been a whole lot of studies that have been conducted, or the studies are you know somewhat mixed in terms of their quality, um, or uh, they produced mixed results in some ways, or you've got an intervention that's really new. Uh, and hasn't really been evaluated much, um, then you definitely want to gravitate more toward the hybrid one type uh, study, possibly a hybrid two, uh, but probably more like a hybrid one where you really want to see 
you know, you really want to focus on effectiveness and, and contribute evidence in that regard. On the other end of the continuum, you know, if, if, if the evidence base is pretty strong, if you think it's pretty strong, moderately strong, um, and you, again, you don't anticipate adapting it a whole lot, you have a pretty good intervention um, that doesn't need to be uh, modified significantly. And that could be true even for a program uh, like a collaborative care model um, that's been tested, road tested and so forth. And you got a sense that this is, doesn't really require a whole lot of adaptation, um, then you can sort of think about maybe hybrid three is where you wanna be. So another um, distinguishing feature among the three types of hybrids is, is who designs and delivers the intervention. Not surprisingly, when you're in the hybrid one space, um, that intervention is more likely to be uh, designed and delivered by uh, research teams under sort of controlled conditions. Um, for example, some of you might know Randy Curtis, a colleague of uh, over in the School of Medicine who recently passed, unfortunately. Um, he developed this nursing-led intervention uh, that ensures that patients with criti critical illness care, uh, with critical illness, um, that they receive care that's concordant with their goals. So really an intervention to, um, a nursing-led intervention to promote guideline concordant care, uh, goals of care. Um, he, he, he conducted a hybrid one trial where, where in an ICU nurse who was on the research team was trained in the communication intervention uh, to work with patients and families and the physicians. Um, and that trained ICU nurse uh, who was part of the research team delivered the intervention. So again, uh, that, so it looks a lot like sort of an effectiveness study with an emphasis on control and standardization of delivery. Um, the, the primary aim of that study was to uh, was really um, to focus on the intervention's effectiveness. Do we see more uh, documented calls of care? Do patients report that that care was patient-centered and aligned with their goals and so forth? And, and then there was a secondary aim uh, around implementation outcomes, is particularly interested in, in uh, assessing how, uh, how the providers, how acceptable this intervention was to the providers and the patients and the families that participated in that. You know, as you move more toward that hybrid three end of the continuum, you're going to see the intervention uh, delivery, especially design, but really the delivery focus less on trained research staff and more on existing staff in those particular settings. Um, and as I indicated earlier, when interventions are being delivered by practice setting staff, e even if they have support from the research team, you know, you may see some variability in the fidelity with which the interventions are delivered. Um, that can be a little bit variable when the practice staff deliver it. Um, and you may actually may, the, the causes and the extent of that variability may be really important to study. And so that may be something that, you know, say a hybrid two, you really want to focus on. Okay, having answered this question, at least provisionally for, this, uh, for the um, study you're thinking about, then the next question you wanna think about is how much you expect to have to adapt the intervention or need, uh, or the intervention will need to be adapted for where you wanna study it. And again, if, if a lot of adaptation is gonna take place or if the core features of that intervention are gonna be delivered, if there are gonna be some deep adaptations, then you wanna gravitate more toward the hybrid one. Um, if relatively little adaptation is going to take place, maybe just a little bit or, or perhaps not even any, um, then you can certainly gravitate more toward that hybrid three end of the continuum. Let me just ask, stop here and just say, do people, as you think about your particular study and in the intervention, um, do you have questions uh, or, or want to chat through or talk through sort of these first two questions with respect to your study? And again, um, this would be great to engage with you about this so that others who are participating in the workshop can kind of hear what the issues are, the questions that you have and, and how, I'm, how I, might, I might think about it. Brian, I'd love to, if I can take the sure. opportunity. So back to collaborative care for mental health. Mm -hmm. There, what I'm interested in is low barrier care settings, which are structured quite differently than primary care settings mm -hmm. and expanding the list of conditions that this is usually used to address. Yeah. So although there's very strong evidence, it's with depression in primary care. So mm -hmm. really talking about sort of changing two aspects of it. So for the first two, for the second question, I would say there's 
a lot of adaptation since it's mm -hmm. really both the way in which it's delivered and how things are structured as well as what it's targeting um which i think i think you're saying is pushing really more toward a type one even though it's a very established model of care yeah so um your what you're describing sounds to me like uh we haven't addressed the, the the last two questions the second the third and fourth question yet but just where i'm thinking about it now is this might be a really good uh um kind of study to do in that hybrid two model um because you are making some significant adaptations to the to the delivery to the model especially the delivery aspects of this that could impact how effective it is um when you move it you know, when you have uh, staff, different kinds of staff with different levels of training, uh, delivering, uh, you know, working together in this collaborative care model. Um, you're going to have to make some significant changes to this. One. I think when you move it to that low resource model, and you want to know, well, when we when we structure the model this way, you know, do, does it work as well as sort of the 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 model that we tested in our earlier work? So I can see how by uh, you're going to be adapting that collaborative care model in pretty significant ways that are worth checking to see is it still effective. Plus, you also, and what makes me think even more so about hybrid two is you also indicate that you're going to move, you're going to stray from the evidence base by including, looking to see if this is effective for conditions that really haven't been explored or tested or evaluated uh, in those earlier kinds of studies. So to me, this sounds like you're both interested. You're interested in two questions. One is, can we implement this and imp get it implemented well? You know, uh, uh, when we modify, when we deliver this, when we uh, when we design the collaborative care model uh, to be in it for, for 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 low resource settings, can we get good implementation that way? In addition, you know, um, can we also uh, see if it works as well, not just for mental health when implemented in this alternative form, but also for these other kinds of conditions that you mentioned. Thank you. Yeah. Other questions that people have, this is, I'm trying to make this interactive and workshoppy. So Brian, I have a question. Yes. Um, so I'm on a team of folks who've done collaborative care for chronic pain in rehab mm -hmm. clinics. And we've done this now with three different populations, um, but out of, you know, UW clinics and I guess, and we're looking at more of like, how do we get this actually adapted into the clinics? So we've done it with research trained clinicians, mm -hmm. um, including myself. Um, and so I'm just, yeah, so thinking about it, we're really, I think, looking at like, how do we actually have a, you know, clinician in there mm -hmm. doing this model has been effective in all three of these studies and helping with um, reducing pain interference and just, you know, people's quality of life and stuff. So I guess, yeah, we're trying to figure out which of these, you know, hybrid trials might might be we're looking at basically implementing in the same clinics but with more of we would treat all different conditions all different types of um uh it would be kind of uh diagnostic agnostic uh um, but focused on treating chronic pain or yeah so uh sure so uh, my first thought as you were talking is that uh, you you probably have pretty good evidence that this works for different yeah. populations so you know, there's enough sort of evidence to say, yes, we, you know, we, we have, we're pretty confident this works and it's going to be effective, but we really want to see, like, can we get this implemented right. in a different context uh, or in a different, you know, different setting? Um, and so we may need to make, you know, we, we may need to think about how to do that. Um, but we'd still want to know when we implement it in this other setting, um, using some of these implemented strat implementation strategies, are we still seeing the kind of health outcomes that we saw mm -hmm. in some of our earlier, more, maybe more controlled kinds of studies? So I would sort of gravitate more toward that hybrid three based on what you said. But then when you said we're going to include, di you know, we're going to be agnostic and maybe include, then it sounded to me like that may be 
saying uh, we may be straying more from that evidence base. So I'd ask you how far you think you're straying in the evidence. If it's pretty far, you're really stretching this now, then you want to move, you know, gravitate more toward the hybrid two or even hybrid one. Okay. But if you're really not straying a whole lot, the real question here is how can we get this implemented well in these other kinds of settings or with different resources and staffing? Then I think you're really asking more implementation related questions. I'd probably elevate that to your primary mm. aim. Okay. Okay. Yeah, that's helpful. Yeah, I think we're looking at the same setting with different providers, perhaps. Yeah. Um, but same focus on chronic pain, but people might have other conditions mm -hmm. that we didn't mm -hmm. treat. Yeah. And so you're, you, you may be still primary. That sounds to me like a hybrid three, where hybrid three. even for the, uh, for the effectiveness aim, or the health outcomes, you're going to be collecting those kind of data and looking to see, do we see improvements in patient quality of life or pain scores or whatever? And do those numbers you know, look comparable to what we've seen under more controlled conditions, you know, in, in our effectiveness kind of trials? But you may also have a, a secondary clinical outcomes that are maybe a little more exploratory, like, oh, in addition to pain scores and quality of life, what about some of these other things that that are of that we think are going to be related? There may be some uh, cascade or spillover effects into other health behaviors or other other health outcomes that that are of interest that maybe are a little bit more exploratory, um, but you want to collect data on that as well. Okay. Okay. Great. Thank you. That's helpful. Yeah. Anybody else not sure sort of based on these two questions? How about this? I'll move forward to question number three and four, and then we'll come back to this. So um, the third question is how much you already know about the implementation barriers and facilitators for uh, the intervention uh, in your context of interest. And again, if, if you don't know a whole lot about what the implementation issues might be, maybe there haven't been that many studies of this intervention in those setting in that kind of setting, or um, maybe uh, or 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 maybe those settings settings are kind of novel and haven't really been studied closely before, so you really don't know. Um, then then you you probably do need to think about. Um, uh, either doing a, a some sort of formative research uh, to collect information about implementation barriers and facilitators, uh, or maybe uh, if you also need that effectiveness data, you know maybe thinking more about that hybrid one kind of uh, uh, end of the continuum. Um, on the other hand, if if you if you feel like you have really good strong effectiveness data, confident that this works and we and that we know it works, and there have been enough studies or, or sufficient number of studies in primary care clinics with a, this intervention or something like it, um, such that you would have a sense for sort of what the implementation barriers and facilitators uh, uh, might be because there's already been published work on it before. Um, or if you feel like you could introduce a formative research aim as aim one in your study, uh, where you do a barrier and facilitator assessment in that implementation context, um, and then refine your implementation strategies um, then you could sort of gravitate more to that that type three uh, end of the continuum. So ask yourself sort of how familiar you are uh, or how confident you are that you have a handle on what those likely implementation barriers and facilitators are going to be uh, in implementing in that in that setting. And then the fourth one is whether you're ready to sort of evaluate real world implementation strategies or packages. And I, you know, I'd love to get. Uh, pick Jeff's brain, Jeff Kern's brain a little bit more about what he meant by this. It's not entirely clear even from reading the man, the article from which it comes. But but again, I think the the it's related to question number three. Um, uh, because we want to select implementation strategies that target the, the implementation barriers or the challenges that are either operating in that uh, implementation setting uh, or are likely to be active in that implementation setting, um, if we have a sense for what those implementation challenges are, um, and we have a pretty good sense for what implementation strategies we could bring to bear to address them, then you know we can think about uh, moving more in that hybrid three kind of space. Um, if we either don't know what those implementation challenges or barriers are, question three, or we do, but we're not really sure how best to address them, like which implementation strategies we would want to employ, uh, to do that, 
um, then you know we may want to move more toward the middle of uh, hybrid two or even a hybrid one kind of kind of study. So again, let me stop there and just see as you're thinking this through in the particular study that you're thinking about questions about where you will land with respect to these two questions. So just coming back to say Julie's example, from what I can remember, um, you know, you may already have because you've been in these this this low resource setting or more resource constraints constrained setting, or there's been a lot of work done implementing interventions in those kinds of settings. You may have a pretty good handle on what those likely implementation issues are going to be. Uh, in which case, and you may also have a sense for, you know. Yeah, there are going to be some knowledge and skill issues here, um, or we're going to have to really change the workflow uh, in these clinics to really get this implemented. We're going to have to sort of change how the communication takes place in this practice um, and introduce more of a team-based model because they're, they don't really have that in place really well. Um, and, and you have a sense, you know we, we, we know, we know we can address these knowledge and skill deficits with training. We've done workflow. We know workflow redesign is, is a, a strategy that we've done. We can help them do process mapping and, and come in and really think about how to redesign their workflow and so forth. Then again, if you have that kind of information in hand about the likely challenges and what you could use as potential strategies to address them, then you can be more in that sort of hybrid three end of the continuum. If this is a really novel setting and you don't have that kind of information or handle on uh, in terms of what the implementation challenges are going to be, you know, or or even what you could do to address them, then then you probably do want to think about doing some of that more formative work and, and gravitating more to the other end of that continuum. I'm just curious, Julie, how would you answer these questions? Yeah. So one thing, it's not actually a low resource ses setting. It's okay. a Sorry, high resource. Mind. That's okay. Just, just because it is, I think, relevant. It's a low barrier setting, so low barrier care. So it's essentially a different way of providing care, but actually a lot more resources put into it than standard care. Um, where I struggle, so I think we, I'm trying to form my question in a thoughtful way. So yes, we know a lot about the barriers in detail from our one specific setting where we've piloted things, but I think there, there are, there's pretty consistent evidence across the literature and what the key barriers are. Mm -hmm. Where I struggle with number four is the, the implementation strategy or package in part because so much of it is localizing and adapting to very specific circumstances. Mm -hmm. um, and so I'm a little bit stuck there. And I guess I'm asking for your comment on when a key part of implementing something is a lot of time spent adapting it for local conditions and context, mm -hmm. how would you approach that idea of a real world implementation strategy? Yeah, so um, maybe a related, so that's a good question. Um, I guess an issue is how much researcher support um, will be needed to really guide that uh, adaptation, modification, adjustment to those local conditions. If, if there's going to be a lot of support and you want to really, really want to have a high degree of support or control for that, then you know you probably want your research team to be much more involved in guiding that process. Um, you know that, and you're not really sure how you know what the best way is to do that. They may be one approach to this. An alternative is. You might think about, say, practice facilitation or implementation facilitation, which involves sending, if you may know, a sort of trained quality improvement expert uh, who also has experience in organizational change management um, to these practice settings um, who can provide much more flexible, individualized implementation support to those practices uh, or to those settings, recognizing mm -hmm. that you know in, in some of these low barrier settings, they may have this particular constellation of issues uh, and that require certain kinds of implementation supports. But then you know, in, a, in another one of the low barrier settings that you're interested in implementing, they may have a different configuration of issues and challenges that they need to work through. So what needs the implementation strategies or supports that need to be provided might need to be uh, tailored and a little flexible 
um, mm -hmm. an implementation strategy like implementation facilitation or practice facilitation is sometimes called um, is is I think a really adaptive, a really useful way to to to, to think about this. And th th I've I've seen that work really well um, with primary care practices. That's why it's called practice facilitation, where you know, you've seen one practice, you've seen one practice. So even when it comes to implementing a, a fairly evidence-based standardized kind of thing like cardiovascular uh, uh, disease prevention and treat management, you know, blood pressure, um, uh, uh, cholesterol medications, aspirin, um, uh, smoking cessation counseling. I mean, those are really robust interventions, but getting them implemented, each practice is going to have a slightly different set of implementation issues. So you, a one size fits all standardized implementation strategy is probably not going to address all those different circumstances. A more flexible form of an implementation strategy like implementation facilitation may be a way to provide that sort of customized supports that are needed. You're like, I'm having an aha moment. That was so helpful. Thank you. I need to sure. learn more about practice facilitation. Yeah, there's a pretty good robust literature on it. Um, and uh, it is used, um, it has been used, especially in the Veterans Health uh, Administration, VA uh, context, around implementing collaborative models. So um, there's a pretty good literature on that. There's There are variations of this. You can have internal facilitators and external facilitators or a mix of internal and external facilitators uh, to this and even smart designs trying to figure out like, you know, which combination of internal and external facilitation is best or how much of a dosage needs to be delivered to provide the supports the site needs. So there's a, there's a pretty robust literature out there uh, of people who've used implementation facilitation as a strategy to help get collaborative models, especially in mental health, uh, delivered uh, at least in the VA context. Yes, Mark. You are on mute. No worries. I still do that myself every day. I'm all excited. <laughs> um, <laughs> thank you, Brian. Um, I just had a what I think is a, a, a maybe more higher level, less detail oriented question, but I'm curious whether you think these qu these questions are equally weighted in how they lead you to a decision about a type of method? Because for example, I'm thinking uh, after answering one and two that I would strongly lean towards a hybrid one design. Answering questions three or four make me think mm, potentially a hybrid two, but it feels like questions one and two are pretty critical to the decision. So I'm just curious for your thoughts there. It's a great question. And Mark, I would love to ask Jeff Curran that question myself. Um, he didn't indicate in a published article where he he he, he uh, um, uh, generated these or published these questions, sort of how to weight them. Um, I, I tend to agree with you. I think the real question, because the distinctions between hybrid one and hybrid three really have to do with, you know, whether you want to emphasize the effectiveness or the implementation aspect. And a lot of that has to do with how good's the evidence that we have here? How important is it to strengthen that evidence base? Are we really ready to kind of move uh, from does this work kind of questions to, you know, can we get this implemented to, to me, that's like the primary question. And these other questions I think are more nuanced and maybe help me figure out whether I'm all at a hybrid three or a hybrid two, or um, for example, we're a hybrid one versus a hybrid two. So I sort of tend to think about that. But I also want to say the other piece of that is important here is your comfort level <laughs> with doing this. So most of the folks that I work with are, are, um, clinicians at Harborview or at, uh, at uh, Seattle Children's or Fred Hutch or, uh, in the Seattle Cancer Care Alliance, you know, they're, they're intervention researchers. <laughs> they like to, they're, they're used to doing trials uh, to really try to figure out whether an intervention is effective, a clinical intervention or some sort of navigation or patient care intervention of so forth. And that's their comfort zone. They've been highly productive, got lots of NIH grant funding like that. And they're not implementation researchers. They're not exactly sure they totally understand or what implementation research is, but they're curious. And so like uh, they kind of want to dip their toe in this, but they don't want to, they don't want to stray too far from what they know. Uh, and so Randy Curtis was a great example of just one person. I don't want to pick on Randy, but you know, he was curious enough to reach out to an implementation scientist and say, hey, you know what, I would do this as a normal pragmatic effect, uh, effectiveness tri pragmatic trial, but I'm curious, so maybe I could collaborate with you. How about we do a hybrid one? Let's take a baby step here. <laughs> you know, I mean, she had actually done some work pre previously on this sort of uh, nurse-delivered 
uh, communication intervention to help improve uh, the care that's being provided, make sure it's more uh, uh, goal concordant um, for patients and families. Um, so it wasn't like he was starting with a novel intervention, but he just felt like his comfort zone is, I don't want to go beyond a hybrid one. I'm like, oh, that's great. You know, after a couple of years of working with him as that trial went forward, you know, I was able to kind of walk him a little bit closer to the hybrid two kinds of space. We started thinking about, well, how could we, how could we get this intervention implemented as, you know, with, with hospital staff? rather than the trained ICU nurse that's part of the research team. Like, could we train people in the healthcare in at Harborview in how to do this intervention uh, with patients and families, whether it's the social work folks or maybe an ICU nurse that's already there. And so now he was beginning to think about, you know, what implementation strategies could we use to get this implemented? And then we'd want to know, well, okay, if you have a, 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 a nurse, an ICU nurse in the ICU there and you train them or you have a social worker at the hospital training them, you know, now that you've changed the intervention delivery agent, you, know, you want to, are we going to see, does this work just as well or not as well, you know, uh, as, as that, you know, it, it could be better in the sense that those folks may have greater credibility uh, and familiarity with the clinicians um, and, and therefore you get, you know, you just get greater buy-in and engagement uh, or it could be less because they may not have, you know, uh, the level or depth of training uh, and comfort with doing this that the trained ICU nurse who was on the research team in the hybrid one study had. So it can go either way. Any other comments or questions at this point? Okay, let's provisionally, um, I'll provisionally, I'll assume that provisionally you've kind of landed where you are on the hybrid continuum here and you haven't signed off on the call so you haven't gotten scared away yet from doing hybrid study. And let's move into um, some of the other features here. So uh, part of the worksheet there is to just encourage you to kind of complete this worksheet for the study you're thinking about. It can be really high level, um, but just to kind of sketch out some of the elements. So you can see, I. Left here um, uh, in the second column, you can kind of indicate which hybrid uh, type you're thinking about. Um, and then uh, in the worksheet, uh, I think I attached this table, or actually it's a variation on this. It's a little bit more complete because I couldn't fit that full table um, that is in your handout on a slide, but it looks pretty similar. And, and what I'd like to encourage you to do um, is to start maybe completing, again, if you want to workshop this, is to just go ahead and start completing some of the um, some of that worksheet you know, um, in terms of these particular attributes or design features. And while you're doing that, I'm just going to drone on here and fill the airtime and just mention some interesting features. Um, give you some time to, to kind of do this. Um, I uh, have a colleague, and I, I mentioned Randy Curtis in one of the examples of a hybrid one trial. Let me offer up an example of a, of a hybrid two study uh, that a colleague of mine in the Department of Health Systems and Population Health is, uh, is posing. She's active, actively writing that grant application um, uh, for submission in another couple of days here. Um, and I had a chance to, she asked me if I would take a look at it and review it. Um, and so, she has developed an intervention uh, uh, that targets uh, tiendas. Uh, it's a retail environmental intervention to increase uh, the um, that targets tiendas uh, that increases that is designed to increase the uh, cons the purchasing and consumption of fruits and vegetables among Latino um, uh, residents in a community. Who shop at the at the tiendas and so forth. So the intervention involves a whole bunch of stuff about they work with store owners and store employees um, around uh, purchasing, uh, inventory, uh, promotion. Uh, they provide training. They do live demonstrations of how to prepare some of these foods. So there are a whole bunch of intervention components really designed to increase the availability and accessibility of fruits and vegetables in these tiendas and affordability of them, as well as uh, interventions that engage uh, shoppers um, um, to encourage them to purchase more of these and teaching them how to prepare or cook for them and so forth. And in 
her line of work, she's part of a research program, they'd already done an efficacy study and an, then a, a, file, a follow up uh, effectiveness trial of this particular intervention called El Valor. And uh, it was modestly effective in terms of, you know, demonstrating some increase in fruits and vegetable consumption, and certainly on purchasing um, and fruits and vegetable consumption among the, the, the Latino customers and in, in these particular tiendas. But it was really, it, there was some room for improvement, she felt like these were modest effects. Um, they weren't really durable. Um, and they tended to focus more, I think, on the men rather than the women, there was a stronger effect size. So she was thinking, I, I think that more in this intervention could be adapted so that it would be more effective. Um, and what she was thinking about, she's gonna make some adaptations to the intervention uh, to bring it from Southern California where it was tested to Yakima Valley, uh, uh, which, where the, the populations and the, both the retail environment as well as the communities, the Latino communities in these two uh, parts of the US are quite different. Um, and so she, she knew she was going to have to do some adaptations to the intervention in terms of like what fruits and vegetables are highlighted and, you know, um, other kinds of things that, that might go in. But what she was really interested in doing is also changing the delivery agent because she thought if she changed the delivery agent of the intervention, she could actually increase the potency or effectiveness of the intervention. Specifically, uh, in the earlier efficacy in the effectiveness trials, she had uh, trained bilingual research assistants or research staff, research specialists, delivering the intervention to the Tianda owners and employees and actually doing some of the cooking demonstrations in the Tiendas themselves. And what she wanted to do, what she's proposing to do in moving that up here is switching the delivery agent from trained bilingual research assistants to promotoras, these community health workers um, that already work uh, in the particular communities in, around the, in the Yakima Valley. Um, and she felt that, uh, she hypothesized that not only would this be an interesting change in sort of the implementation strategy for getting this implemented in these communities that would improve its reach and, and, and so forth and its fidelity and, and all that, but that these community health workers may have greater trust and credibility and relationships in those communities than the trained research assistants that, that, um, that she used in prior studies. Um, and so they may be more successful in engaging the uh, the tienda owners and the engaging the employees in the tiendas in the intervention and so she could not only get more of that inter she could get more of that intervention implemented more of the components of that multi-component intervention implemented and that with greater with greater fidelity or more imp uh, intervention components implemented the tienda customers would be exposed to more intervention components and potentially more potent intervention components as well, such that this would not only support the implementation of the intervention in the tiendas, but also make the intervention more powerful or more effective uh, for the customers that are exposed to it. Um, so that's an example where, you know, she decided uh, because she was shifting this, that she would do a hybrid two kind of trial. If she wanted to look at both and she thought that it's equally important to really look at um, how adapting the intervention, both in terms of the content as well as the delivery agent, uh, um, influences the effectiveness of this, but also how switching the intervention delivery agent might increase the implementation outcomes that are achieved. For example, the extent to which um, uh, the the intervention was implemented with with fidelity or uh, um, and fully and completely. So that's just an example of a hybrid two. And as we move more from the down the continuum from hybrid one to hybrid two to hybrid three, you see more of the intervention delivery and possibly even the intervention design really being informed by uh, uh, and, and delivered by uh, existing staff uh, using existing resources uh, or you know with more co-design. Uh, with community participation or community engagement or stakeholder engagement and even what the intervention is because there's more adaptation potentially taking place there or there, um, there's more delivery being done by folks who are in the staff rather than research staff. So let me stop there and just see, again, check in with folks. Questions that you have as you start thinking through some of these design characteristics for the hybrid type, type that you're thinking about. 
either in terms of the outcomes or the study design, the, uh, uh, the units of randomization, some of the evaluation methods you might use, anything that you, that you might have questions about. Um, hello, I'm Trang. Yes. Uh, and yeah, uh, and um, I'm um, my question is that uh, to implement the point of care testing in antenatal care and link the patient to appropriate care. So to ensure the women will uh, the mother to try transmission of uh, viral hepatitis B will be under control with mm -hmm. this model of care. So to me, I'm a bit uh, confusing in identify the intervention strategy intervention versus implementation strategy and how to frame it within um, the like a research proposal for the, I think the type two would be more uh, appropriate for my uh, questions. So I think um, the intervention um, is using the point of care testing and mm -hmm. also link the patient to care is also the, um, the intervention that has proven that they work effectively. And um, in terms of implementation strategies, I would um, think that implement it in low setting um, areas, like um, in rural area mm -hmm. at primary care level would be the best because like it will use, um, it's most use of the point of care testing at their place and ha help them to link the patient to appropriate care. Mm -hmm. So, um, so, it's a bit um, confusing when frame it into um, the strategy. Is that like a model of here or is just like, because I'm listing the intervention as <laughs> my implementation strategy. So it's confusing as can I call this like a bundle of strategy or is just things like that? Because when sailing it out loud, it kind of, okay to hear but when say it in like implementation strategy mm -hmm. it's confusing me and to look at the outcome yeah sure sure so i i would based on what you said so far i would think about this either if you're going to do a hybrid trial or hybrid study um that you consider doing a hybrid three um it is possible um that you might want to just consider doing a straight up implementation trial or an implementation study rather than a hybrid one for the following reasons i'm guessing that we have pretty good evidence that this point of care testing is effective at detecting the disease condition i'm sorry i missed what it was um and that we we know that this test is is effective uh in in as a as a device for detecting um or, or uh for the disease and and so your study is maybe at this point, the question is less, is this a, an effective point of care test? And more like, how do we get this point of care testing, which is already evidence-based, implemented in a setting um, that uh, in, 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 a, in a setting where it currently doesn't take place, um, uh, especially in, in, in um, yes. So, so to me, that's what you're, what seems where you are in this research program is, less on sort of what should we do or what's an effective, you know, how effective this point of care testing is. And it doesn't sound like you plan on modifying the point of care test itself in some significant way. So we should expect that it's going to be as effective, you know, uh, that the test's effectiveness is not going to change, even if you move it from one setting to the next. Um, really what the interesting question here is, is how do we get this implemented in this other setting? Um, my sense is um, what you, the, the real question then is an implementation related question uh, rather than effectiveness question. The way I would approach this is um, you're probably going to need a bundle of implementation strategies to get this integrated, this point of care testing integrated into this, into this particular health care setting, uh, delivery setting. Um, what particular implementation strategies you would need depends on your sense for what the likely barriers are for getting it implemented. Um, it could be that, for example, that the staff need training in how to do the point of care testing and how to administer it, um, what it is, what it's good for, and so forth. So they may need some educational training around that. Um, 
it may be the case that um, that um, the point of care testing uh, involves uh, may require uh, physical space uh, to do or certain kinds of resources that are needed um, that are different from why the clinic is currently configured or its patient flow is configured. So there may need to be some some workflow redesign. Um, there may need to be some revision of professional roles. So this is going to be now delivered by a different level of healthcare worker than previously um, in that setting. So there may be a variety of implementation strategies that you want to bring to bear on this um, to help support the high, the consistent uh, high quality delivery of this point of care testing so that all the patients, all the providers who are who should be using the point of care testing in their care are doing so, um, and that they are, and that all the, for example, all the patients who should be receiving that point of care testing are doing so. So those would be, those are kind of implementation outcomes rather than effectiveness outcomes or health outcomes. So the way I'm thinking about this is, this sounds very much like a hybrid three or possibly, like I said, um, even even a, a straight up implementation trial because it's, um, it sounds like the evidence is pretty solid for for point for this particular point of care test. Yeah, thank you. Um, I just wonder because like for point of care testing is just the first stage. The second stage is link patient to care, and I would love to see if this kind of like using point of care is increased testing. But then at the end of the um, pregnancy, would any patient was retaining care to that, 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 that stage to get uh, appropriate care to prevent the mother to try transmission? So um, that's why I think I would love to look at the patient outcome mm -hmm. to see if only um, if this work in low low resource setting. Mm -hmm. It's just not about the implementation things, but it's also how they sustain it and how the patient was retaining care. So it's Terrific. kind of like the whole cascade of care. Terrific. Do you intend to do something or try something to, uh, to encourage retention in care? Or are you just looking to see what happens under sort of usual care conditions? Oh, I will do something like uh, have somebody to navigate care and um, like assign things to keep patient come back to pre prenatal visits because mm -hmm. like in rural areas some patient is just come at one time and then they skip the the the, the, the visit it's like that that's great this is again sometimes there can be more than one way to think about this issue but i'll share with you how i'm thinking about it so i your your point is absolutely well taken it is no good to do a test and then not retain people in care who need it. Um, but retention in care, um, that could be, you could think about that as a health outcome or health behavior of the patient, um, in which case that may be something you wanna, you wanna include as your, uh, as, a, as, an inter, as an effectiveness outcome. I, I tend to think about it as more of an implementation outcome because you wanna retain people in care, but it's, it's not the retention per se, that changes people's health, uh, health outcomes. It's what happens. It's the actual care that's delivered when you're retained that makes the difference. Um, and so, uh, especially if you're planning on doing something to try something to, to help the patients retain, to maintain, uh, in, to retain in care, then to me, that would be a really good sort of implementation outcome, which is the percentage of patients who should be retained in care who are in fact retained in care as opposed to do the patients who retain, who remain in care or retain in care, do they have better health outcomes? That's an effectiveness question. Yeah, again, I thank you, yeah. Yeah, I, again, there may be, you could say, no, I actually wanna think about that as the health outcome and that would be perfectly fine, in which case you definitely could think about this as a as a hybrid type three and and to label that as a uh, as an effectiveness outcome that you're gonna tr you're gonna you're going to um, assess um, for sure. But uh, to me, retention and care still sort of feels like 
something that you're going to, especially if you're going to do something to try and encourage that, that's less of an intervention than it is an implementation strategy to promote retention and care. And you would then be evaluating the effectiveness or the success of that strategy um, by the length of time somebody's uh, retained or the uh, proportion of those who should be retained who are. And, and again, those are not health outcomes or health, those are maybe health behaviors, but they're not health outcomes as I think about them. So they're less about the clinical effectiveness of, uh, of uh, and, and they're more indicators of, of, uh, of a, a change in what you're doing to help people retain and care and, and whether or not it's effective. I see. Thank you. It's clearer now. Hey there. Um, just to, to jump onto that question, I, would you, um, this is uh, Alex Lankowski, um, uh, just a question about the outcome of uptake. Um, mm -hmm. I kind of have struggled with a similar question um, uh, analogous to what we were just talking about with the sort of retention and care outcome when I'm thinking about uptake and, um, for example, uh, you know, doing, implementing some model of care or intervention or implementation strategy uh, to improve prep uptake. Um, I, I, the same way um, for retention and care, I could see that being framed as both a, a implementation or a effectiveness outcome. Yeah. So again, um, in, in people who are effectiveness or intervention researchers and people who are implementation scientists or implementation researchers can have different perspectives on things. To me, um, the percentage of, of patients who are eligible to, uh, to take up PrEP who do so um, is an implementation outcome. It's a goal. It's, the goal there is to get more people uh, onto effective care. Um, whether PrEP is effective, what kinds of health outcomes those people have as a result of taking up PrEP um, is an effectiveness question. Or, and, and so to me, retention and care, uh, uh, uptake of care, uh, uh, even though they are, uh, they could be considered um, health behaviors on the part of the patients, um, from the perspective of an implementation scientist, and we're going to try and do something to increase those kinds of things, um, and those mostly have to do with um, stuff we're going to do in the in the setting, either with the providers or in the settings. They they make sense to me to think about them or conceptualize them or conceive them as uh, think about them as as implementation outcomes. But as I said before, different people coming from different disciplinary backgrounds can have a sort of a different perspective on those particular questions. But to me, uh, the percentage of patients who take up prep uh, who are indicated for it. Um, is a great implementation outcome. It would be uh, service penetration in the implementation outcomes framework or reach in the re-aim framework. Got it. That's helpful. Thanks a lot. Yeah. You know, whether those patients short data on the health outcomes that are associated with PrEP uptake, to, to me, those are more like the effectiveness outcomes we'd be looking for. Yep. Got it. Thank you. We are down to the last handful of people here, and I am happy to hang out uh, if any of you uh, want to talk any further about this. But I also want to um, encourage those of you who are, feel like they've gotten everything they can get out of this um, to, uh, to go ahead and sign off if you wish. I really appreciate your joining us. Hopefully, you found it to be useful uh, and informative. And I'm also available to um, meet and talk individually uh, with you if uh, uh, if it, you know, if at some point in time you'd like to flesh this out a little bit further, or, if, or even if you still just have questions about about hybrid study designs, so please don't hesitate to reach out to me. I'm quite available. <laughs>